Bulavinaka and welcome to another episode of Gold FM's Speak Your Mind. This week, I'm your host, Dion Davu, and of course, joining us in studio today, we actually have two guests from two separate organizations. First up, from the WWF Pacific, that's the World Wildlife Fund for Nature Pacific, their conservation director, Mr. Francis Arecki. Francis, a very good morning to you and a very good day to you, rather. And of course, thank you very much for taking the time to join us on the show. Thank you very much, Dion. And uh, yes, first up off the bat, tell us about, this, uh, about yourself and the role that you play within uh, the WWF. Okay, basically, um, I'm the director of conservation for the WWF Pacific program. Um, the program basically um, manages the three country offices in Fiji, Solomon Islands, and PNG. And for Fiji specifically, we have two major programs, which is the Great Sea Reef. Um, and this is the third longest barrier reef system in the southern hemisphere. It extends from Undu all the way through Mboa and down along the um, coast of, uh, western coast of Viti Levu. And the second element of our program is around sustainable fisheries and uh, standards. Um, and this looks at uh, especially industry like uh, tuna and trying to get um, certifiable standards like MSC, which is the Marine Steward Certification uh, to demonstrate sustainability of the industry. Yeah? So a lot of our work deals with um, trying to demonstrate that industry are moving into a, a sustainable sort of um, direction or actually making a change through the operations. And of course, this is for our fishing industries, all industries which actually use the ocean as a resource or rather nature as a resource. Yeah, so a lot of our work um, is it's split into two. The first is offshore and it, it deals with tuna because tuna is the major sort of um, income generator for the fishery sector in Fiji. And then we also work with uh, partners such as the Ministry of Fisheries to actually address some of the coastal fisheries issues with communities in terms of management and also the, um, I think you might have heard around protected areas yes. and, and also managing those uh, systems better for the communities. Huh? Now, apart from those uh, specific initiatives, what else does the World Life Fund for Nature do? Uh, well, our primary focus is oceans because we're a maritime nation and uh, in terms of our contribution to our our global sort of targets. We operate out of 80 countries um, and each of those countries have to contribute to like um, a major sort of um, impact in terms of one of the various ecosystems. So ours for the Pacific is, is basically the ocean because we're, uh, we're, um, we have a large sort of um, area in terms of uh, oceans compared to land. So a lot of our work deals with fisheries management and trying to manage those systems within the oceans because our economy and our livelihoods basically depends on, the, on oceans. But then aside from that, we also have um, aligning sort of work to deal with forestry and addressing issues that may impact the, the, the coastal ecosystems such as sedimentation. So that's why we, we do a lot of replanting work with partners as well. And we also look at agric agricultural sort of um, uh, projects as well to demonstrate sustainability with uh, model farms especially. And then we also have um, additional work around climate change, which is more policy driven and also demonstrating um, impacts with the communities. Huh? So it would be safe to say that uh, the WWF is attacking the problem on all fronts, yeah. the legislature side, on the actual people on the ground doing the work and, of course, uh, raising awareness yeah. in communities. It's not just WWF. WWF recognizes that um, we have very strategic partners, which include government, the corporate sector and also other CSOs. We, what we actually do is try and uh, make very strategic alliances in terms of, um, in terms of uh, generating traction with uh, collective work. Uh, rather than just saying that WWF does everything, we try and build on the strengths of the, the various partners and make sure that we're making some sort of impactful change. Uh. I see. Very yeah. interesting. And uh, over the course of the weekend, uh, we uh, celebrated rather WWF along with uh, many other citizens here in Fiji and around the world as well celebrated Earth Hour. Now, yes. do you want to elaborate more on that for us, please, Francis? Yeah, so Earth Hour uh, basically started in 2007 in Sydney. Um, it was part of trying to um, uh, garner uh, awareness around the climate change issue uh, because at the time a lot of people, um, especially skeptics, um, refused to actually acknowledge climate change was having an impact in various parts of the world. Eh? So the, the uh, focus of climate change at the time was to raise um, the bar on trying to uh, get um, champions to actually raise the cause for climate change and have that in the policy discussions, not at the regional, but uh, also at the international level. Eh? And that's what's been happening. Um, uh, first off the block, uh, I think we should acknowledge that Fiji is one, uh, one of those countries that uh, actually uh, ratified the Kyoto Protocol when it was still um, being discussed by the developing, uh, the developed sort of countries. Eh? So Fiji has always been on the forefront um, with um, climate change. 
and um, Earth Hour became part of our, our core work in Fiji in terms of trying to get uh, Fiji to be part of the championing cause at that international platform. And I think um, our Prime Minister currently is one of those champions and is very vocal and is very visible uh, raising those issues about the Pacific in Fiji and not, not only Fiji, the Pacific, and taking up to those forums so that it can actually go into the dialogues with other world leaders. Huh? So, so, so that's, that's the gist of what climate change is about. The hour is commemorative, it's to raise awareness, to get people to understand that climate change will definitely have an impact on you and future generations. And our stance now is not to just focus on uh, Earth Hour, but actually see what can you do beyond the hour. In terms of simple things, like uh, we, we don't believe um, that you, know, you, can, you can make a drastic change in a day. Yes. But we feel that um, if you as an individual, as a citizen, can make certain changes to your lifestyle, Collectively, that will have an impact um, if everyone starts doing the same thing. Huh? A good example would be if I just took the effort to uh, recycle the rubbish that I have at home. Exactly. So if me and many other people like me yes. make that make that change, of course, yes. uh, as a collective, uh, yeah. the changes will definitely be yeah. tenfold or so. So it, it, it even includes just like using uh, single-use plastics. Uh, you know, a lot of the plastics actually require uh, fuel to actually, um, fossil fuels to actually manufacture. And that contributes to um, climate change sort of issues as well with carbon emissions. So if you take a stance to actually reduce your use of single-use plastics, then basically you are contributing to the solution uh, rather than uh, being part of the problem, right? Yeah. And the theme for the 2019 Earth Hour was hashtag connect to Earth. Would you like to uh, tell us a little bit more about that theme? Yes. Um, so the, the, this is a recurring theme that has been, uh, been in place since 2018, and it's geared towards 2020, which, uh, which most environmentalists call the super year in terms of uh, political discussions. Because the, uh, in 2020, quite a lot of um, uh, instruments that govern um, countries' contributions to international commitments come to a conclusion, and then they will renegotiate for the next 10 years, which is 2030. So just uh, some of them include like um, the Aichi targets. Huh? The Aichi targets basically establishes uh, the contributions uh, from each country in terms of how much they will protect for terrestrial environments and the marine environment, which is basically 17% of uh, a country's uh, ter uh, ter uh, terrestrial environment and 10% uh, of your, um, say, your EEZ. So each country is supposed to target that. And uh, 2020 is the deadline to see that we can achieve it. Eh? So at, at the end of uh, December 2018, uh, we are uh, basically achieved 14.9% for the terrestrial and roughly 7.3 for the marine environment. So we're on course. On course. Uh, but the thing is, um, the, the discussions for 2030, uh, it needs to be more aggressive and more ab ambitious. Um, also coming into play next year is um, the COP26, which is basically talking about the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement basically sets out the instruments for each country to reduce emissions uh, so that we actually do not exceed 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. Because if you go beyond 2 degrees Celsius in terms of global That's warming, drastic, drastic warming, it's catastrophic. Not only for, we, basically, it's going to make life very difficult. And so um, the conversation needs to be had uh, by 2020 so that when they're setting the goals for 2030, um, you're actually making more sort of impactful change with those targets that they will set next year. So that's why they call it the super year, because all these various um, political platforms in terms of determining what countries will contribute to comes into play. And it's, it's critical that the governments actually uh, make uh, very concrete statements about trying to address the issue that, rather than just uh, whitewashing it again with uh, more, ta more targets that, that's not going to make any change. Yes, yeah? I see. Well, thank you for that, uh, Francis. Of course, with us in studio today, the Conservation Director for the WWF Pacific, Mr. Francis Arecki. We'll have more for you in our next segment. Welcome back to Speak Your Mind. Joining us in studio today, the uh, Conservation Director for the WWF Pacific, Mr. Francis Arecki. Yes, uh, you made uh, very interesting statements about uh, the IEG protocols and, of course, what's happening next year in 2020, where the governments and, uh, yes, all the major stakeholders in the environmental game around the world pretty much look back on the last few years and then look forward to see uh, 
what more changes we can make. Yeah, that's basically it. That's very interesting. And of course, uh, also throughout the weekend, the WWF had a number of mangrove planting initiatives. Yes. Tell us about that. Yeah. So uh, previously, we used to have a lot of our Earth Hour sort of awareness around the urban centers. Uh, but uh, the theme essentially from 2018 till 2020 is uh, to ensure that our citizens connect to nature. So part of our effort this year is uh, not to just uh, turn off lights. Th that's that's part of it in terms of the awareness. But we wanted to actually demonstrate what can you actually do at the community level. So we had isolated one of our communities in in Tavua, Korovo Village, uh, which is also part of a um, climate change adaptation project that WWF is implementing with partners. Um, and one of the issues that was, I think, it's 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 a, a recurrent issue around the current is around waste. And unfortunately, mangroves are usually the dumping grounds for, for a lot of the waste. Huh? So uh, part of the uh, package that we actually promoted on Earth Hour um, during the day in uh, Corvo Village was actually to get the community together, clean up the mangrove areas. Um, we actually work with the Tavo Municipal Council that they actually came and pick up the, the rubbish as well. And also we planted mangroves in certain areas to actually... Um, uh, improve the uh, productivity of the area over time. Huh? So uh, a lot of people actually look at mangroves as just uh, pretty much wastelands, but a lot of people actually forget that the productivity of fisheries in is a, dependent on is mangroves, dependent a healthy on mangrove. a hang, ha healthy mangroves. Huh? So a lot of people forget that this really stink, practically non very aesthetic sort of place. Uh, they actually forget that it has a lot of. Um, Eco ecological service that it provides to communities, especially in terms of food. Um, so that's that's essentially the um, the the focus. And also, uh, WWF is part of the Mangrove Alliance, which is also a campaign to raise uh, a stronger sort of uh, protection from for mangrove areas, uh, because these are the forefront for protecting coastal areas. And also, when you talk about food security. And also, um, it, it, just say for instance, a disaster. There's quite a lot of literature that's out there that shows that if you have mangroves um, in front of villages, and if there's uh, like very high tides, it actually protects the village itself. Huh? So these things uh, have functions, like valuable functions that we might not consider in terms of monetary term, but they actually have a, a purpose huh? with, uh, with you, community. You made mention of the Mangrove Alliance. Uh, if there are any interested uh, organizations or individuals being a part of that, how would they go about being uh, a part of the Mangrove Alliance? Well, the Mangrove Alliance is uh, a partnership with a number of existing um, NGOs and regional um, entities. Uh? So it does not um, limit um, uh, other sort of uh, corporates or, or perhaps community-based organizations if they want to be part of that uh, campaign as well. Uh? It's very simple. If you have um, an interest in protecting mangroves, then you can have the conversation with WWF and we can link you up to what whatever the Mangrove Alliance is actually doing in terms of conservation and protecting mangroves in the country. That's great to hear. And of course, um, in your work as the uh, head of the department or the conservation director, you would have noticed the health of the mangroves here in Fiji. Uh, at this moment in time, do we have a healthy mangrove, uh, how would you say, healthy mangroves here in Fiji? Um, or is there still a lot to be desired? Uh, the thing is, when you say healthy mangroves, um, Mangroves will always be healthy, provided they're in the natural environment. I think the bigger issue that's affecting mangroves now is the mass clearance of some of these yes, areas uh, in terms of development. Um, WWF does not um, try and prevent development, but it, it necessarily wants to have that conv conversation around sustainable development. How can you actually incorporate mangroves into development as well? Uh? And the other issue as well is, um, um, one of the issues is especially the dredging. And um, I, I think a lot of people, because they don't understand the eco ecology of mangroves, when they dredge the rivers, they actually dump it in areas that um, have a lot of these species called brugaria. And they breathing <laughs> they breathing roots are at the base of the tree. I see so when they put the, so the sediment, the they pretty much smother it. Huh? So there's different species within a mangrove ecosystem. The one that you usually see around Mysore Park, uh, that's uh, most like, uh, mo mostly rhizophora, which have those very aerial sort of roots. Huh? But um, a lot of the dredging actually kills uh, the mangroves because they're dumped simply into, um, into the spaces because they don't understand the ecology. They, sh they should actually dump it in other areas huh? to not damage the mangroves as well. 
So they try and address a problem around sedimentation and then create another problem. So, um, in other words, not a lot of thinking, not a lot of foresight has gone into what they're doing. And uh, just connecting it with uh, what my next uh, question is. Now, does the WWF actually offer services whereby if I'm a particular individual or organization who happens to be uh, undertaking a development near a coastal area and I know there's uh, specific ecosystems that should not be damaged, does the WWF exist the, uh, help to uh, help these people out with uh, the uh, studies, so to speak? Um, in terms of um, our focus areas, uh, a lot of our effort is focused around the Great Sea Reef area simply because of that major reef system. I see. Uh, so it's uh, a lot of our work is focused around uh, Madawatambua, Lambasa and, and Ra. But um, it does not limit if communities want um, advice from us. We can actually direct them to the correct sort of partner that could actually assist them with whatever they're identified as an, a need by the community. Yeah? Thanks for that, yeah. Francis. Well, it seems we've reached the end of our time together. Is there anything else you'd like members of the public to know very quickly before you do leave us? Yes, just simply that everyone um, is essentially a conservationist and it, it shouldn't uh, be something that WWF or for myself to actually come and highlight. Uh, I think everybody has a role to play. We're all citizens of these countries. We have a shared resource. So you, you need to just make a difference with your lifestyle and just be sure that you understand wh whatever you're doing has an impact as well. Huh? Thank you very much, uh, Francis. And of course, yes, we wish you and your team all the best for 2019. Thank you very much. Pulvinak and welcome again to uh, Speak Your Mind. Joining us for our second half of the show from uh, the My Fiji Shark Campaign, we have their program coordinator, mm. Natasha Morosi, and of course, a marine biologist also involved with the campaign, Mr. Ben Sangata. To the two of you, Natasha and Ben, thank you very much for joining us uh, today on Speak Your Mind. Bula, bula. Yes, bula. and uh, yes, I'm going to begin with you, Natasha. Please do tell us about yourself and the role that you play within uh, your organization, the uh, My Fiji Shark Campaign. Hola, everyone. My name is Natasha Morosi. I'm the Director of Conservation for Beng Adventure Divers, and I am the Program Coordinator for My Fiji Shark. And uh, yes, Ben, how, what do you do with the program, if yeah. you don't mind me asking? as well. I'm uh, Ben Sagata. I'm also one of the uh, part of the Beng Adventure Divers, and uh, I handle the all our research activities in our, in our program. Where we normally look after our conservation work and other research activities as well, too. Okay, and uh, for me personally, and of course for many of our listeners involved, sharks are an amazing creature. And of course, both of you must spend quite a bit of time with uh, these amazing creatures. But yes, for many of us as well, they're often very misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Now, and of course, I can see in doing my research about the My Fiji Shark Campaign that uh, your respective organizations are trying to uh, help in the conservation efforts as well as, uh, yes, give people uh, a better understanding of sharks, if I am correct. That's correct, actually, Dion. Um, so uh, to say that um, they're misunderstood is to really put it mildly. Let's just be clear and, um, and say it for what it is. A lot of people are just downright afraid of sharks, okay? Um, myself included. I mean, I remember being a little girl and, and looking at my toes when I was going in the water and wondering if there was going to be something that was coming after me if I went any deeper. And, uh, you know, it took a long way to come from there to where I am now. I mean, Ben and I spend um, five days a week diving with these sharks. Um, where we are diving on Shark Reef Marine Reserve, we can see up to eight different species of shark per dive. But what we're really known for worldwide is our bull sharks. Bull sharks, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen quite a few videos of bull sharks, and I've had the opportunity to uh, see them in the water, but I haven't... Uh... Just tried diving with them yet. But yes, you meant men mention of species. Now in Fiji at this moment in time, Ben, I'll give this question to you, seeing as you are a marine biologist. Mm. In Fiji, in general, how many species of shark do we have in Fiji waters? Uh, well, with us, we have uh, like eight different species of shark you know, during our dives. And, uh, but in, in general, in, in Fiji, I think we have uh, mo well, more than 15, 15 different species of shark. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for uh, well, for instance, uh, with uh, with our uh, you know in our in our dive site, we have like uh, uh, bull sharks. Bull sharks are one of those massive, massive you know bulky sharks, okay, with long pectoral fins. And then we have uh, these gray reef gray reef sharks, uh, and uh, also we have white tips, black tips, and uh, at times we also have uh, tonino sharks, sickle sickle lemon, silver tips. 
And of course, Tiger Shark. There's a massive. Oh yes, I love Tiger Shark. Yeah, yeah. 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 Everybody loves tiger. tiger Shark. They're, they're pretty <laughs> cool looking yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. yes, now in the uh, Bengal Lagoon, mm. that's a protected sanctuary, if mm. I'm correct. Yes. So, and you made mention, uh, Natasha, that there are seven to eight species of shark in that lagoon that mm. are part of this program. Yeah, so we're actually not in Benga Lagoon. Oh, we're off Benga Channel. Excuse yeah, me. it's mm. okay. A lot of people misunderstand. They can totally confuse it, and that's fine. We're actually um, off the coast, the southernmost coast of VC Levu, so off the coast of Pacific Harbor. It's called Shark Reef Marine Reserve. Right behind it is the Benga Channel. Mm. So it's not quite Benga Lagoon, but yeah, absolutely. Like Ben said, we have up to eight different species of shark. I mean, we're people come from all over the world to come and dive with our bull sharks because it's the only place in the world that you can dive with the largest mm. aggregate of those bulls. I mean, we get up to, on the peak season, up to 100, 90 to 100 bull sharks in one dive. Wow, that, that is certainly a lot of sharks. Now, what do those numbers say for the overall health of the various species in the area and, of course, in Fiji waters? Well, way back, way back, uh, way before that, uh, you know, the area was actually being, being uh, you know, being uh, demarcated, being declared as an, as an MPA, Marine Protected Area. Uh, you know, people or villagers used to dive there, you know, doing spear diving, and uh, they used to see like a few sharks around. But right now, you know, from that time up till now, we're beginning to see a significant increase in the population of sharks. We just got to show that, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, conservation work is, 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 well, is taking place. And also because of the fact that, that the whole area where we're actually diving right now is being regarded as a, as a marine sanctuary. Uh, and we are so fortunate with the government that. Uh, uh, that the same spot has been uh, right now being declared a first national marine park in Fiji. In the entire Fiji, the area we've been diving now is being regarded as, or being declared as a national, the first of its kind. In the that is, that's truly commendable. That yeah. is. And uh, really at this moment in time, are there any other plans to make uh, other areas in Fiji marine reserves? Or would the uh, Shark Reef Marine Reserve be the first of its kind? I mean, I'm hoping it's not the last of its kind as well. Well, as we speak right now, we've uh, we've uh, we've uh, get information that there are a couple of uh, resorts too. They are uh, trying to you know have their, their area being declared as an MPA uh, and, uh, and further uh, enhance it to a uh, uh, national park like the uh, like the Wakaya 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 Resort and and in a resort in in uh, in, uh, in Kandalu and uh, and it. it Yes. But it's just got to show that, uh, you know, by, by protecting the sanctuary of this, uh, uh, um, the, the sanctuary of, of all of the marine, marine life, it just, it just has so much beneficial, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, enhancing population growth and also marine biodiversity, uh, which is very, 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 very well. And if I could jump in, sure. I just want to communicate to our listeners, and this is the thing that, um, you know, everyone who's on the ground, who lives in fishing villages and relies, you know what I mean, mm. on um, uh, to sustain their family, like, and their, and their lives, the hoods, mm. by going out and fishing every day, that um, it takes a long time, you know what I mean, to put together something like this, to, to work with villages, to work with the government, you know, mm. it took, um, in 2004, uh, Shark Reef Marine Reserve was designated an MPA, okay? And that mm -hmm. was through hard work with the village of Naloa and Bang Adventure Divers and the Ministry of Fisheries. And only 10 years later after that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, did it de be declared, cabinet declared it, you know what I mean, the Fiji's first national marine park. But in the meantime, what happened was is that Naloa, giving up its traditional fishing rights, received a levy from every diver that dove the reserve. And so in exchange for giving up the fishing rights, they were receiving money which with, within which they could build infrastructure and use for education and use for various projects. Mm. And all well, the meantime, while this area is being protected and everything in the reef ecosystem from the tiniest of fish to the big apex predators are coming back and now overflowing, spilling into the neighboring fishing areas so that their fishing yield is 10 times over what it had been, you know, 10 years prior. All of these things are actual tangible benefits, you know what I mean, that people living in these fishing villages and coastal areas can recognize and understand, you know what I mean, and for them it's worthwhile then to make a commitment, you know, to make a marine protected area if their future generations and their families can see the benefit. Thank you for that, Natasha, and of course do stay with us, we'll have more in our next segment. Yes, uh, 
Joining us in studio today, representing the My Fiji Shark campaign, we have uh, their program coordinator, Ms. Natasha Morosi, and of course, a marine biologist uh, very heavily involved with the project, Mr. Ben Sangata. To the two of you, welcome once again, and thanks for your time. Now, uh, during the break, Natasha and Ben, yes, we did say that uh, the Shark Reef Marine Reserve is a perfect example, or rather a perfect model of what can be applied uh, across other areas of Fiji. Now, uh, if a community was interested in following that model, how would they go about doing that? Hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, would, they, would members <clears throat> of, uh, say, people from uh, somewhere in the far-flung maritime islands, would they be able to come to you guys and visit and say, hey, we're really keen on doing something like this ourselves? You mean to um, to protect an area yes. or to, okay, yeah, because there are so many different ways, you know, that people can, and there are interests and there are some things that are going on now that are in the works. But I mean, primarily, it has to come from within, right? The generation the, the generation of the interest has to come from within, from the village themselves. And of course, it, it it's the right people in the right place at the right time, you know what I mean? Coordinating together. Um, of course, we you know working alongside government and Ministry of Fisheries and without going into too much, um, we can just say that there are some projects right now that are going to align with the um, UN Ocean Conference 2017, the voluntary commitments that the Fijian government made, you know what I mean, with respect yeah. to the oceans, um, coastal fisheries management and shark and ray protection, that there are some things in the works now, you know what I mean, that, that um, we should see come to fruition before 2020. That's interesting. Now, getting into the thick of things, what exactly is the My Fiji Shark campaign? Okay. <laughs> so My Fiji Shark is actually a shark adoption program, okay? Um, Benga Adventure Divers created this program with the support of the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, um, in order to further the interest that we had um, with respect to SDG 14, life below water, um, shark and ray protection, you know, of uh, uh, Fiji shark um, population protection and their critical ocean environments because um, Bang Adventure Divers at its core, which is something that Ben and I, ben and I know and are, is in our bloodstream essentially, is that we are a conservation group running a dive shop, okay? It's not the other way around. Um, our main interest, our mission, our goal, our objective every day is the protection, the research and protection of Fiji's shark populations, okay? So, but to that end, we need to protect the environment within which they live, okay? Because what is a jaguar going to do without a jungle, right? That's true. What is the shark going to do without a reef? You need everything to be flourishing, to be working properly, all those different pieces in the, in the ocean's ecosystem. And so um, for us, uh, it's our primary goal. And what we thought would be a really good way to achieve some conservation uh, goals and also help to change people's perception about sharks would to be to launch this program. Um, ben can tell you about our scientific database and our sharks and how we can actually do this. So I'll give it to Ben. Yeah, firstly, uh, so, um, you know, when we talk about conservation, we really talk about, you know, controlling and sustaining the habitat of, marine, of either marine or, or all terrestrial life. Okay, so controlling the, uh, the home address is very, very important. Okay? You know, animals can only thrive well if their home address is okay. And that's what we're aiming for, to try and control and maintain and sustain their natural habitat. And then uh, once our, their home is, is, is controlled, is maintained, and sustained, then only then, you know, production will, will just thrive on yes. this. And this is very important that we, we need to keep this balance. The balance is very important. And we are there as managers, as controllers, you know, and we are there to sustain our level of activity. It has not to go beyond the destructive level. And that is very important about, about uh, you know, um, conservation work. And, uh, you know, initially uh, we were talking about that, uh, you know, the, 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 well, that particular area that we're now being used as our shark diving or shark feeding, uh, you know, um, uh, area uh, was being really being a, a breakthrough between the, the well, the, the villagers of Ngoloa, who are the traditional owners of the uh, old reef, and uh, and uh, we had to include the government to come in as, as a mediator to kind of, to try and uh, make an agreement between us so that we can just become a stakeholder to run the show, you know, and uh, and we are so thankful that Ngoloa villagers, you know, they just given their the green light, and there we are uh, running the show there, and every single and every single uh, and, uh, voluntary uh, payment coming from the guests, you know, goes back to the community and you know to do whatever they want to do, whether to build the, the church or the community hall of for their education and whatever and that. So we need to, we need to, uh, you know, we need to um, include the, the natural, uh, the, uh, the resource owners, 
you know, as being part of the whole whole show here, you know, and, and that, that is the real model. It's all a collective effort. Collective effort. Very exactly. interesting. And uh, yes, for me personally, well, I'm an avid nature lover and uh, I do manage to get out where, whenever I can. And many people don't realize it, but sharks are very important to a healthy ecosystem, yes. even though they are the top apex predator yes. in the ecosystem. It's something sort of similar to uh, the wolves in Yellowstone Park. Mm -hmm. yeah. About 25, 30 years ago, yeah. they reintroduced the wolves and yeah. they realized yeah. all the other animals yeah. came back as well. Yeah. Now, for you as a biologist, I mean, you must absolutely go nuts, so to speak, when mm. you see these beautiful specimens in and around the mm. water with you. And uh, like you mentioned earlier, that on a day, on certain days, on really good days, you can have uh, over a hundred and a hundred different types or rather individuals in the water from the various species. Mm. Mm. Now, can you talk a little bit about that? Now, when you say, um, I was doing some research. Now, sharks actually have uh, attitudes and personalities. Yes. This is correct. Now, this ties in with the Adopt a Shark mm. program. Now, if I was an individual or if I was a business organization looking to adopt a shark, how would mm. I go about that? Okay. I'll take the question. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay Dion. So um, it's very simple. We have an amazing website, myfijishark.com. Whether you're an individual or you're a corporate entity, um, we have so many different types of adoption packages uh, for you. On the corporate end of things, we can actually create something custom. But if you are like me, like yourself, Dion, you know what I mean? You just go online, check out the sharks. And what we have is, is we've actually separated our sharks into three different ranks. Um, we have shark stars, shark superstars, and shark icons. <laughs> <laughs> the stars, I superstars and icons. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So the icons, like you you can imagine, <laughs> right, are like the celebrities of the shark world, okay? So Ben and I, since we spend so much time, um, and our staff that spend so much time with these sharks in the water, know these sharks, like you would know your neighbor or your cousin or your best friend, you know what I mean, or your children. Um, they have their personalities, they have their behaviors and characteristics and their life histories, okay? And every single shark dive, when we go down, Ben is taking observations and making notes. So we have a slate set up. Um, he's taking notes. He's entering everything into a scientific database that's been maintained for over 15 years now. Um, we have 216 named individual sharks. But you cannot adopt all of those. We only have 50 of the most frequent visitors to the reserve um, on the website for adoption. Um, these sharks, just so, so everyone knows, are Fijian, okay? They, they, they are residents of Fiji. They don't go off to Tonga. They're not going around the world, South Africa. They are Fijian sharks, okay? So um, you go online, you, you want to find a shark that has a, a really wily personality, maybe a little trickster, maybe a really a sweetheart, a sweetheart of a shark. Um, you can find the shark for you. Thanks for that, Natasha. Something very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you locked in, sharks have personalities and... Uh, Yes, you can adopt one as well. Do stay with us. More coming up after the break. Welcome back to Speak Your Mind. Joining us today, our second pair of guests. Yes, from the My Fiji Shark campaign. Miss Natasha Morosi and, of course, Ben Sangata. And the both of them are very blessed to be working with... Uh, some of our most majestic creatures in the ocean. And for us here in Fiji, of course, the shark does have a very significant cultural significance as well. And uh, <laughs> yes, Natasha, you did mention that uh, many of the sharks that uh, you can adopt do have a range of personalities. Now, just getting back to that adopt a shark campaign. Now, of course, when you adopt a shop, there's money involved, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And all the revenue generated from adopting a shark, where does that go? So all the money generated goes right back into shark conservation. So like I said earlier, I mean, our primary objective is research, advocacy, protection of Fiji shark populations, okay? What we've um, decided to do and the reason we created this project is because we want to ally ourselves directly with government, you know what I mean, and government's voluntary commitments for 2019, which ultimately, um, I mean, I'm sorry, for 2020, ultimately is the protection of sharks and rays, of Fiji shark populations of sharks and rays in the critical environments, okay, here, and also inshore fisheries management. Those are the two really critical um, voluntary commitments that we uh, as my Fiji shark with the revenues that we're making off of this program are allying ourselves are standing at the ready to help in the implementation and the regulatory or enforcement end you know what I mean of these commitments 
when government steps up, you know what I mean, and enacts legislation, puts things into play, brings out uh, these initiatives. This is this is. One thing I have gathered from talking to the both of you over these last few minutes is that uh, this whole My Fiji Shark campaign, this would not have been possible without a collective effort on the side of the uh, Benga Adventure Divers, on the side of the villages of Ngaroa, on the government as well. So it, right. in other words, conservation requires a collective effort. It's right. not like, oh, I'll just sit back and relax <laughs> while Ben and Natasha do all the work. <laughs> That's not how it works. No. But yes, I'd just like to make it clear to our listeners joining us uh, this afternoon and of course our viewers on FBC television that it is a collective effort and it's thanks to uh, individuals such as yourself and your organizations that are just trying to make things better. Now, uh, getting back to sharks, of course, in your estimation, uh, Ben, now I know that you patrol, uh, the, that you do a lot of your work in uh, the uh, Marine Reserve there, and uh, but do you feel that we here in Fiji have a good attitude in general towards shark conservation? Well, we still we still trying to you know to get the message across to you know right right from the grassroots level up to you know from from the upwards you know because we know that uh, you know there there's a lot of there's a lot of illusion about sharks you know from you know from from films like Jaws and all yes. this kind of you know so people have a different perspective sharks because of those films because of those you know uh, you know computerized you know so uh, and uh, yeah but you know you know for us like we dive the shark ten times a week. We dive with sharks ten times a week, and uh, we're just being, you know, just being infested by sharks every single day. And uh, <laughs> so it, right. it, it connects it. They come and touch you. These are massive creatures. These are uh, predators, and they're not tame. And they're not pets. They're wild. And we are with them in the true natural neighborhood. So when we are with them in the true natural neighborhood, we just have to be very, very respectful of where we are. So respect to us is very, very important. When we are with them, just like in any wilderness, we just have to be very respectful, alert, and just be cautious of where we are because we don't belong there. We belong on the surface of the world. That's true. You that know what is I mean? very true. So when we are totally different wilderness, and it's just so amazing when we go into a different, you know, a wilderness like the, you know, the under the, in the ocean, it's just so so majestic. You know, it just goes to show that creation. There must be someone who created this. That's world. true. That is absolutely true. Yeah. You have to wonder about your place. Uh, in this exactly. world, when looking at a creature at, like a shark, yeah, especially in its yeah. home environment. Now, sticking with that, now, Ben, of course, you said that you dive at least 10 times a week. Yes. What's one of your favorite sharks? Well, <laughs> in terms of species, I, I always adore this, uh, what you call, uh, silvertip. Silvertip silver sharks. Silvertip is just so beautiful. And is there, a, is there a particular individual that uh, you have your eye for, on? For bull shark or for silvertip? For the silvertips. Uh, well, right now, we still haven't, uh, you know, made a long, a good list of uh, the, the names, but uh, yeah, but in general, silvertips are my best. Uh, my best. And Natasha, uh, if I may ask you the same, <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't ask me that question. I have uh, my list of favorite sharks grows oh, every you day. Oh, have a list. <laughs> but is you there know, a particular I have, one? Yeah, I have. I have a particular several. So um, yeah, I have. Uh, so blunt is one of my favorite sharks. Nautilus. Brenda is also, mm. uh, Crook is one of my favorite sharks. There's a shark named Crook? Crook yeah. Yes. Does his name uh, allude to his nature? Dion, she, it's a she. Oh, she. <laughs> and mm. Crook, she is a very crafty and trickster and mm. sneaky shark, but she's a big dominant female, mm. and she likes to play some games under the water with mm. you. And you'll only know if you come and dive with us. That's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, 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 Dion, this, this is a massive creature, right? Mm. It's a massive creature. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about names. So we actually give names to most of these big bull sharks, okay? Mm. And uh, we give names by trying to identify some of the markings. It's not normal. It looks a little bit peculiar, but it looks permanent on the exterior part of the body. Some they may have now these are scars or scars that looks permanent, mm -hmm. okay, but does not scar today and after two weeks just heals off and disappears again. It's no point naming. So we go to look for certain marks that looks a bit permanent, looks peculiar, but stays for a while and we give names, okay? Unfortunately they don't know the big name that way, but we know them. Okay. <laughs> and so we don't only know the names, but we also know their personalities right. like Latas was showing, okay. So it's the individual shark they have they just behave differently. Some are cool, some kinda of timid, some kinda of lay back and watch others are doing, some are a little bit cuckoo. I think every true. species has yeah. its fair share of cuckoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, <laughs> moving on, yes, just, just heading back again to the Adopt the Sharp initiative. How long yeah. has that been running? And uh, For about six <coughs> months now we've been running. And how has the response been so far? Uh, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Like We've had so much interest in this program. Um, we've actually uh, generated some new uh, divers, you know what I mean, through this program. Um, we've had people come from all over the world adopting sharks for their children, for their spouses, you know, for themselves. 
And I have to tell you, in terms of the local, um, you were asking before about the local perception, you know what I mean, about sharks. Um, everywhere that I go, you know, I'm always wearing a My Fiji Shark t-shirt or a Bang Adventure Divers. And I use um, I use it as, a, as an opening piece because people will often comment, you know what I mean, about my shirt. And I talked and I, every opportunity I have, I talk to, you know, people he, living here, here, you know what I mean, in Fiji about sharks, about the ocean, because so many people don't know, you know, yes. what they have in their backyard. And when I say that Ben and I, every day that we dive with these sharks, I feel blessed. He feels blessed. You know, I'm blessed that, that God's given me the opportunity to share the ocean with this magnificent creature who's been virtually unchanged for hundreds of millions of years, you know, and that, um, that I, you know, I, I have respect, you know what I mean? But we get respect in return from these sharks, you know, which is incredible. And so what I do is I tell people, get out in the ocean, learn to dive. You know what I mean? Do, broaden your horizons a little bit. Just just try to understand and see from a different perspective. And when you start talking about a shark's personality, people, you know what I mean? People latch on right away because it's like they have a dog, they have a cat, they have a, an animal or a pet with a personality that they can relate to, you know, and, and the idea that there's a shark named Batman, right? Who's really <laughs> cool and really fast and comes out of nowhere and disappears out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, Batman, like the Dark Knight himself, um, really generates an interest, you know, and, and, and people really open to, to understanding, learning more about sharks. That's great to hear. It would seem that, uh, yes, we've reached the end of our time together. But before we do go, is there anything that either of you would like our members of the public to know in regards to the My Fiji Shark campaign or in sharks in general? I would have to say if um, just go online, go online to myfijishark.com. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not ready to adopt a shark now, no problem. I just invite you, come online, look at the sharks. There's so many pictures, it's eye candy, so many videos. Share it with your children, share it with your families. You'll be so shocked to see the, you know what I mean, the different personalities and the different attributes that you never knew. I mean, and these guys are living in your backyard. <laughs> they certainly are. Thank you very much, the two of you, for your time. Yeah. And of course, joining us today on Gold FM Speak Your Mind, we had a representative from the My Fiji Shark Campaigner, Ms. Natasha Morosi, who is the program coordinator, and of course, the marine biologist closely associated with the program, Mr. Ben Sangata. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much. We'll talk again later.